All right. Ooh, nice and loud. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the third um, segment of our Black, Gold, and Green speaker series. Thank you uh, for taking the time to come out tonight, students, faculty, staff, community members, and all. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, and we know especially for students, it's a really busy time. It's midterm season. Uh, spring break is upon you, and I'm sure you're very excited for that. So we appreciate you taking the time uh, to come out here. Um, so just wanted to briefly introduce us a bit, the Hickson Center, and then uh, briefly talk about the series, um, and then from there we'll introduce our speakers. Um, so my name is Lewis. I work with the Hickson Center for Sustainable Environmental Design. Uh, we like to see ourselves as a, a nice mix of a research center, an academic department, uh, and an office of sustainability. Uh, so we do a little bit of everything here on campus, all towards the mission of advancing environmental sustainability, uh, both through education uh, and through sort of behavioral lifestyle and learning. Um, and the Black, Gold, and Green speaker series um, is really meant to tackle uh, broader environmental sustainability issues at all levels. Uh, we know that while there are many classes throughout the Claremont Colleges that do address environmental issues, um, those are often by, you know, particular case study by case study setting. You're often, you know, reading from slides or out, of the t out of the textbook. And we want to sort of expand the picture out a little bit and get to engage with these issues on a more real-time um, case by case issue. So um, we're really glad you could join us for that, and we hope that you'll, um, you'll enjoy this talk. Uh, we're really excited to introduce uh, two people from the California High Speed Rail Authority tonight. Uh, so forgive me here, I'll go ahead and just introduce them to you one by one. Uh, so the first is Melissa Dumond. Um, as the Director of Planning and Integration at the California High Speed Rail Authority, uh, Melissa Dumond is responsible for advancing the authority's implementation of the High Speed Rail Program. Uh, she is in charge of coordinating station area development, overseeing the advancement of integrated service with other rail providers, and management of general corridor planning activities. Ms. Dumond has extensive knowledge of the transportation industry and environmental practices. Uh, prior to joining the authority, she worked in the private sector as a planning professional, an environmental practitioner, and as Southwest Regional Manager for the U.S. Department of Transportation's Federal Railroad Administration where she supported the development of California's high-speed rail system. Uh, Ms. Dumond obtained a bachelor's degree in environmental studies from the University of North Carolina Wilmington and master's degrees in natural resources policy and public administration, both from North Carolina State University. So welcome, Melissa. Uh, and uh, next we will introduce uh, Margaret or, or Meg Cedaroth. Uh, so Meg manages the sustainability program for the California High Speed Rail Authority. Her duties include policy development and implementation, greenhouse gas emissions inventory, tracking and offsets, renewable energy planning, sustainable design, and district scale sustainability approaches. As an AICP and LEED accredited urban planner, she has over 17 years of experience in the areas of transportation and sustainability. And Meg has led sustainability efforts for the Mazdar Institute project in Abu Dhabi from 2007 to 2009, and was active on several projects in the region that explored sustainability criteria for infrastructure projects. She has also worked on complex carbon neutral projects and high performance facilities in the US. She has been with Parsons Brinkerhoff since 2002 and currently leads sustainable design and company initiatives at PB. And Meg has a Master's of Urban and Regional Planning from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. So welcome, Meg. So uh, well, now I'll go ahead and hand it off to you two. Thanks again for coming down, and we look forward to your talk. All right. Can everybody hear me OK? All right, fantastic. So I'm going to go back to the front of this. Make sure you guys can see this. Are we up and running? Fantastic. Well, thank you for having us. Uh, we're here to talk to you about the California High Speed Rail System. My colleague, Margaret Cedarroth, and I have been working on this program for a while now and in various roles. As Lewis explained, we've been watching, we've been taking part in the development of an amazing project. Brace yourself. It is a public infrastructure project that is designed to become a profitable transportation system that runs the length of the state from Los Angeles to San Diego, 
or excuse me, <laughs> Los Angeles to San Francisco and connecting to Sacramento and connecting to San Diego via the Inland Empire. We're also connecting our Central Valley to the Bay in the LA Basin with really rapid travel time. So our system is designed for 250 miles an hour. The trains will travel 220 miles an hour. It will transform the way people move around California. We're here to talk to you about the journey, the experience that will be the California high-speed rail system and share our excitement for a future with accessible and enjoyable public transportation. My name is Melissa Dumond and I'm the Director of Planning and Integration for the California High-Speed High Rail Authority. Excuse me. A couple of questions just before we get started. How many of you have taken a train in California? Okay, that's fantastic. That's a great showing. How many of you have taken a train in other parts of the U.S.? Fantastic showing again. How about in other countries? Oh, this is great. You guys are going to know exactly what we're talking about. All right. And I'm going to learn to use my clicker here. All right. So what is, what is the best journey you have ever taken? Was it a comfortable ride? Was it easy to travel? Were you able to work while you traveled with an, enough room and Wi-Fi connections? Was it easy for you to get to the system, figure out how to get in the front door, get there by bike, by walking, by bus? Our train stations of the past included ticket windows with queuing space, as you see on the right hand, left hand side of the, of the screen here. It took you a while to get through the queuing line. You bought your ticket, you waited for a train. Right now, we've got ticket machines that maybe pop up on the platform, little machines that you can electronically insert your credit card or money into. It takes you a little while. We also have ticket windows in various stations. It's not that easy. You may not be doing other things at the station. You're generally getting your ticket and getting on a train. In the future, we want all of our train stations for the California high-speed rail system to be future-proofed. We want you to be able to get your ticket probably on your phone or some easy way of doing it. Um, you can shop, you can dine, you can meet friends all before or after you get on the train. And in fact, you may have come to that station for another reason. So the time that it takes you to get to your train will be very short. You may, you may uh, use your time for other reasons. You're no longer sitting in a waiting area, queuing and waiting like you might do at an airport or previously. So this concept of seamless mobility is something that we're baking into the system. This uh, slide I borrowed from my friend Niall Ledbetter at San Francisco International Airport who uh, recently took a trip internationally and came back with some great ideas for connecting high-speed trains to airports. In this case, it was the Frankfurt Airport. And he's pointing out here that you can get a th what they call a through ticket. You, get, you buy a ticket on Lufthansa, and that ticket will get you all the way to your ultimate destination, and you may actually use the express train as one of your modes to get there. And this is a, um, a window where you see departures, arrivals, and it's actually showing you everything. It's showing you the planes. It's also showing you where your train is and telling you where to go, which is pretty exciting. This concept is a great one. For Lufthansa, it makes a whole lot of sense. And for the, um, the ICE railway, it also makes a lot of sense because Lufthansa buys seats on that train uh, regularly and they protect them for their passengers so that you can get what we call a uh, single ticket or a one seat ride. You do actually plant your seat in a couple of places but it makes it very easy. And you might check in for your flight, drop your bags off at the airport, you can pick them up at the train station when you get to your ultimate destination instead of queuing up at the airport, grabbing your baggage, finding the train, finding where to put your, your bags on the train. These are amazing concepts. We call it seamless transfer, seamless mobility, and it's definitely how we're planning our, our stations. Another thing we're trying to do with the California high-speed rail system 
and with the money that's invested in the system to build quite a bit of infrastructure, 800 miles throughout the state of California, is to make wonderful places happen. So wherever we have a train station, we want to create a community hub. And we want to make investments that will be valuable to the community, will advance the economics of an area, and will be downright pleasant to be around. That could include, in this case, you know, public art or public park for your, for your outdoor sort of concourse area. It could be retail and shopping. It could be office. It could be a bank. It could be all kinds of things. But we're working very closely with our station cities and with private investors who are interested to try to figure out how to um, make really wonderful places happen everywhere that we will have a station. There we go. So this slide, the takeaway here is the idea of density. So density of development is really good for, cal for high speed rail in general because it means we get more riders. And where we get more riders, we get more revenue. And again, remember, this is a system that doesn't run with a subsidy, so we've got to have a lot of riders. Every investment that we make has to be focused through that lens of will that get us more ridership and more revenue. And so we, we have to think about a uh, private market perspective on all of our investments. Um, density is also good for our cities, where maybe some of our cities have, have um, suffered from a, a, a lack of investment over the years or when the market gets weak, there's not a lot of investment that's happening focusing um, in our downtown cores. We're going to the downtown cores of all of our cities. So we are trying very hard to regenerate the area with any investment that California High Speed Rail makes. This means we're reducing the land needed for new growth because we can do it in an infill fashion. And we're, again, increasing our ridership, which increases our revenue, which is good for our system. And we want to maximize our multimodal access. So say you have a bus station, you've got a commuter rail station, you've got your high speed rail station, even your airport connection. Try to put them all in the same spot. It makes it a whole lot easier for people to get from one place to another and easily transfer between what we call modes. And we want to serve our local communities. We want the stations to be a hub of community activity and a place that people go, whether or not they want to ride the train, might still go to the train station to see some cool stuff. So this investment in compact, sustainable development is also something that we are, I don't want to say obligated to do, but we kind of are. We are a recipient of cap and trade funding. Uh, and my colleague, Meg Cedros, is going to talk about that in a little bit in more detail. And SB 375 is, is a particular piece of legislation that was passed in the state of California that has, that has taught us all that we really need to develop more sustainably. And in fact, it's our responsibility. And if you're using public funds, you have to do it. And so when the counties and the cities and high speed rail and everybody else has a mandate to develop in a more sustainable fashion, we've got to think about ways in which we're going to work together to do it. So for example, if we are building a train station in a city and we might be uh, ripping up part of the downtown to do the construction for the train station, we might as well think about district scale energy or water or um, other solutions that we need to think about underground, on the ground, and then above ground. And you have to do that early. You can't do that late in the game. You don't get as much of a benefit from it. And it certainly costs you more to retrofit than it does to think about it right away. So let's talk about the interstate system for a minute because it's an interesting comparison. The interstate system developed during the Eisenhower administration, one of its main focus was to, to take troops and goods from one point to another. So if you, if you look at I-5, a lot of people ask us this question, why didn't you just follow I-5 with your high-speed train system? You don't need to go through all of our cities. Just go straight down straight down the state, you can get from San Francisco to LA, just stay on I-5. Well, you see the black lines on the map? That's the former Santa Fe Railroad. And there's the I-5 that does, in fact, as the crow flies, get you very quickly, not including traffic, from the northern part of the state to the southern part of the state. The blue, this is the California high-speed rail system, which is largely reconnecting the communities throughout the Central Valley 
to Southern California and the Inland Empire and to the Bay. So today, 60 miles an hour by car, let's see, 492 miles between San Francisco and LA, I think that's a rough estimate, it probably takes you on a good day eight hours. Look what happens. 220 miles an hour by high speed rail, it looks like a shrinky dink. You remember those? Looks like a shrinky dink. What happens to the state, it now takes you two hours and 40 minutes to get from LA to San Francisco. Definitely changes the way we'll move around California. So again, here's a theme. We're connecting the heart of our state, the Central Valley, with the bay and, and with the basin. So agriculture is a um, hallmark of the Central Valley. It's vital to California's economy. The future holds the same, but enhanced with an enriched set of economic values that's going to address the more than 10 million people who are going to be moving to the state of California by 2050. Let's go to an international example here. Lille was perfectly placed for high-speed rail. It is between Paris, Brussels, and London. 80 miles from London, 40 miles from Brussels, 60 miles from Paris. What happened when, when high-speed rail was developed between those cities, Lille's population growth increased substantially because people could access bigger markets to and from. And in fact, it diversified the job market. So Lille's quality of jobs and pay for jobs went up quite substantially. And what you see is a change in the types of jobs to professional, scientific, and technical, arts, entertainment, um, from more of the manufacturing and industrial jobs that were formerly there. California High Speed Rail Authority has to provide a business plan to the legislature every two years. This is the mechanism that we use to explain the strategic plan for implementation of this 800 mile long system. And I think this is the first time I'm showing you a map of the system here. So you can see it, the green shading is our initial operating segment, okay, for the most part. So San Francisco down to roughly Bakersfield, and there's a little more green in Southern California where we're making some major investments in a feeder service speed rail system where we will be in blended operations. That means we're linking up with the Metrolink corridor in Southern California. We're blended with Caltrain in the north. Um, this is our initial operating segment. And 2016 was the first year, Meg and I have been through several business plans. 2016 was the first year, and we're very proud of this, where we were able to present a fiscally constrained plan that showed that with the public funds that we have been able to secure, whether it's federal grants or cap and trade money or state bond money, we can build an initial operating segment, which means we're up and running with trains, which means we're generating revenue, which means the private sector will come in and invest and help us build out the rest of the system. So this was monumental for us, and this was just last year. Why would we bother with high-speed rail throughout California? Well, the bottom line is it's a more efficient alternative. I don't know how much you, you hear this, but high-speed rail actually fills a major gap in California's infrastructure and a need. It's the equivalent capacity that you get out of, out of a high-speed rail system being developed in California between San, San Francisco and LA would roughly cost $158 billion. Now remember, our business plan showed we're at $64.2 billion. Um, so $158 billion and would require 4,300 new highway lane miles, 115 additional airport gates, four new airports with associated runways. I think everybody understands the land use implication of that much infrastructure. And so this mechanism, uh, which just got a sweet spot between cities 200 to 600 miles uh, distance between them, high-speed rail is just a key market. And it's not in America yet. The closest thing we have to it is the Acela line in the Northeast Corridor, and that does not go as fast. And in fact, it's not built like, a, like an international high-speed rail system, which is what we're building. So this is really exciting for us. 
I don't know whether you know this or not either, but high-speed rail is actually being constructed. So we, we work on planning and developing the high-speed rail system. We're um, f financially figuring out how to pay for the system. We're planning it. We're developing and designing and engineering the system. We're also building it. And I'm going to show you in just a second what that looks like. We've got roughly 119 miles started in the Central Valley. It's to date, roughly $3 billion in investments have been made um, building uh, the high-speed rail system. And it's, it's roughly, at this point, Madera to north of Bakersfield. And this is going to start really quick with this video. The California High-Speed Rail Program continues to make significant progress in construction, with work spanning 119 miles through the Central Valley. The Fresno River Viaduct was the first construction site to break ground. Located outside Madera, the 1,600-foot viaduct is nearing completion, with the last stretch that will span State Route 145 now underway. Just to the south, crews are making quick work of the Cottonwood Creek Viaduct. Construction of this 250-foot bridge began earlier this year. Girders have been placed, and the bridge deck has been poured. Barrier walls are now being constructed. In Fresno, crews are working over the San Joaquin River to build a viaduct and pergola structure. The viaduct over the river will be the northern gateway into Fresno, featuring arches, while the pergola will allow high-speed trains to travel over Union Pacific tracks. The California Department of Transportation is overseeing the realignment of State Route 99, which will move the highway 100 feet to the west to make room for high-speed rail tracks. This project is moving quickly, with crews beginning to lay asphalt for the new stretch of highway. Lane shifting has begun on State Route 180 in central Fresno as crews begin work constructing a passageway under the highway. This passageway is part of the two-mile-long Fresno Trench that represents the first below-grade element of the system. In downtown Fresno, the construction of the new Tuolumne Street Bridge is nearing completion. The bridge deck is done. Crews are now working on utility relocation, retaining walls, and roadway paving. The bridge should be open to traffic in early 2017. Where the San Joaquin River Viaduct is the northern gateway into Fresno, the Cedar Viaduct represents the southern gateway. Columns and flare caps have been poured. Crews are now preparing false work in order to begin construction of the superstructure. Two other projects have just begun within Construction Package 1, both in the Madera area. Overpasses are being constructed at Avenue 8 and Road 27. Both of these projects will create great separation crossings for trains and traffic. The first construction work is also underway in CP23. Crews have been repaving roadways in Tulare, while other crews are working to create a berm in southern Fresno. This work will continue to ramp up throughout the early part of next year. So good evening. Um, as Lewis introduced me earlier, and Melissa referenced, I'm uh, Margaret Cedaroth. You can call me Meg since we've met now. Um, and I manage the sustainability program at High Speed Rail. And it's, as Melissa alluded to, an incredibly exciting project to work on because it's not just about that really awesome, you know, widget of the train, but it's about a project and a program that's meant to transform California. And so. Sustainability, as she alluded to in all of her comments, are really at the heart of what we're delivering on high-speed rail. As Melissa explained, you know, the state of California voted yes for this to be the future of our travel, right? We want a more comfortable journey. We want to get our to our destinations in a way which allows us to work, which allows us to recreate, which allows us to not be stuck in traffic for hours at a time. And as a hallmark of California and really a reflection of our ethic of transparency and continuous improvement and sustainability, which is really part and parcel to who we are as Californians, um, the project is intended to deliver on some promises related to uh, achieving our climate goals and expectations. Um, it is intended to be the electrified backbone of transportation in the state of California, and the project delivers 
um, some really good greenhouse gas emissions reductions for the transportation sector. So I know we're at a university, so I know that I can talk about um, carbon emissions and that y'all can look at this, at this slide and just sort of intuit how that happens, right? We all know that when you combust uh, gasoline and diesel, there's carbon emissions associated with it. We understand that when airplanes take off, they're also burning fossil fuels. And this analysis that we conducted using outputs from our ridership model demonstrated to us the value of every passenger mile, right? Every trip that you take on high-speed rail delivers reductions in carbon emissions. That's uh, on its own, right? If we just ran the train on electricity, we would achieve some really positive results related to greenhouse gas emissions. But we've committed to running the train on 100% renewable energy. You know, that is something we can do because we have the luxury of running it, as Melissa showed you, right through the middle of a state with amazing solar insulation and great wind energy. And so we plan to, you know, produce on site where possible and then procure renewable energy uh, in California elsewhere in order to feed our system and that kind of net zero energy approach. So we've talked about this a lot and sustainability, and I'm sure you all deal with this often. Sustainability is a word that just gets thrown out, right? It's delightful to say, it's a lot like offering children candy. We just talk about sustainability. But as a concept, it is very specific to the, con to the context in which you're working. And I, I've worked in many places and I've never enjoyed such a robust policy, regulatory, and legislative context as we do in the state of California. Uh, I think we were talking earlier about AB 32, a signature piece of climate legislation passed in 2006, which set the a uh, goal that we are on track to achieve of reducing our carbon emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. And this is even while California continues to expand uh, its economy and you know, is in fact the sixth largest economy in the world. And last year, SB 32 was passed, which, oh, interesting. You can hear me a bit better if I do this. <laughs> Um, SB 32 was passed, which of course set our 40% reductions by 2030. You know, this is unique in the United States. It's on track with many other subnational um, areas in the world. And in fact, Governor Brown signed the under two MOU, which committed California to achieving carbon emissions goals, no matter what happens uh, across the rest of our great nation. Another uh, element I just want to bring up because it is um, it does allow us to set this renewable energy goal with confidence, and that's SB 350, which established a goal of 50% renewable energy for the entire state of California by 2030. This is in line with what some states are doing. Hawaii wants to achieve 100% renewable in in a comparable time frame, but. You know, this really does speak to the value that we place on renewable energy. We have a lot of work to do to get to that end goal of renewable energy, right? Our transmission and distribution center needs to be upgraded. Our storage capacity needs to match so that we're able to use that energy when it's available. But by setting the goal, it means we're all working toward that common end. So taking that as a theme, I would like to spend a couple of slides going over the specific uh, program of sustainability for high-speed rail. Um, sustainability frameworks allow us to set specific um, guidelines and targets for people to aim their work toward. And it is, as I mentioned, always unique to the context in which you're working. I know we could all probably talk about the triple bottom line. And in fact, you know, sustainability for us is, of course, making sure we can meet our needs today without sacrificing those in the future. Um, you know, that definition certainly implies that actions taken now for current development are not going to hamper future actions as well. And it also means we don't want to bequeath future generations to a financial burden in order for us to achieve what we need in order to develop. But I found um, in looking at the high-speed rail program and working across the different disciplines, working across each of the areas of the agency, that sustainability for us really I, uh, kind of coalesced around these five key areas. And it's a comprehensive program. It touches every discipline and every element of the program being delivered. 
um, all the way from what we do in our stations and our station design to how we manage our business principles, how we treat our employees, um, as well as you know, elements around the delivery of construction. So I think it was great that we started with that first, um, first video because I do spend um, a lot of time focused on how we can achieve better outcomes in, in our construction delivery. And you know, if you look at this slide, I guess I'd love a show of hands in the room, somebody who could just off the top of their head talk about greenhouse gas emission scopes. Oh my gosh, you haven't had that class yet, have you? Okay, well look forward to it, it's gonna be great. You're gonna read a lot about the GHG protocol and you'll learn a lot about how reporting happens around carbon emissions. So this gives you a picture of the overall program and where within that program we have particular um, areas related to carbon emissions. And I think if I can point, I can. This right here is our uh, estimated amount of emissions we'll produce in construction. And we've made the commitment to being carbon neutral in, this, in construction. You know, this is a, it's a very big undertaking, uh, but it's important to us because we want the train to be delivering benefit to California as soon as possible. And it also helps drive decisions and requirements in our construction documents that are changing how we deliver infrastructure in the state of California. So as I said, this, uh, this is a conceptual illustration of our construction, construction emissions and construction boundary. And well, it is very funny when I talk this way, it's much louder, perhaps I, I'll just turn this way. Um, you can see that that commitment to um, off being carbon neutral in construction first means we are driving down the boundary as low as we can. And I can, we can do this in California because of the benefit of some interesting regulations, right? We have a low carbon fuel standard in California. We've incentivized and required the purchase of renewable diesel at the state level. Renewable diesel has, um, nearly nearly zero impact on the overall kind of carbon story in the atmosphere, which means for us it would be reducing that carbon boundary pretty significantly. We've also required the cleanest tier of equipment. This has a profoundly positive air quality benefit on our site, which I'll talk about a little bit further, but in just thinking about the carbon story, when you're eliminating um, PM 2.5, you're also reducing black carbon, right? That kind of uncombusted bit of gunk that goes up into the atmosphere and is a short-lived climate pollutant. And it's, it's important that we, each project, each element of what, of what California is doing to deliver the infrastructure we need is pay, paying attention to these issues. Because when everyone, right, when a thousand of us make one small decision, we achieve a pretty profound outcome. Now the benefit of a $64 billion program is we can start leading the pack. We can start requiring elements that make a difference. So by requiring the cleanest equipment in the state, we are seeing that you know, there's greater turnover in the fleets overall. And by requiring recycling, 100% of all the concrete and steel on site will be recycled. By requiring that, we're actually incentivizing uh, that, that part of the value chain around um, the recycling industry. We've seen our contractor who is doing the recycling add employees and staff and expand their facilities. You know, and so it's really sending that signal into these smaller markets to start making changes around green behaviors. So as I mentioned, we're trying to set a new standard, a new model for construction delivery, for infrastructure delivery in the state of California. In the future, of course, we'll operate on 100% renewable energy. From time to time, a contractor will report to me that they purchased a wind credit, which is delightful to me, but I prefer that they focus much more closely on recycling, on using really clean equipment, on um, you know, doing their reporting and disclosure, uh, as, as we were talking earlier, data actually really helps us. And by getting information out of the construction process, we're better able to understand, you know, what are, what are the influences within this, this sort of quote unquote problem area in terms of carbon and, uh, and uh, pollution. So the final bullet in here is about exploring materials life cycle. 
I'd love another show of hands. People who have done life cycle assessments. Oh, okay, great. She's gonna be teaching the class that y'all are gonna take sometime. Um, this is a way of exploring the, the kind of entirety of what goes into the products that we use. And it is a, you know, it's a, it's a sound scientific basis. It actually allows you to discover what happens in the whole supply chain of getting a material and allows you to understand where you can start making improvements. So, Melissa and I have very fun jobs. And we uh, do a lot of traveling around the state. I've had uh, several conversations with folks in the dairy industry in the state because we are exploring every opportunity to deliver a greener piece of infrastructure. Yes, we are exploring the use of biogas. It's, you know, we're still understanding exactly what we can do as an infrastructure project to help enable this space to grow, right? Again, eliminating methane is an important part of delivering our benefits, both in terms of air quality and uh, carbon emissions. Um, but we're also looking at things like renewable diesel, as I mentioned, um, and looking at um, just every opportunity we can take to really improve what's happening on the program. As I mentioned, I get a lot of data out of the construction. And this is data not just for its own sake. I think we've taken pains to explain to people that it isn't because I, I love getting a dump of information that I, we've required this data from the contractor. What this information tells us is what's happening on site. For example, from 2015, we looked at our inputs from our contractor and we discovered that most of the carbon emissions on site were coming from site vehicles, not from the equipment. So that tells us when we want to influence what's happening within that boundary, we're gonna look much more closely at new hybrid electric vehicle technology, start requiring hybrid vehicle technology for the fleets not just you know, a, a newer fleet, an fuel efficient fleet, but one that's actually demonstrably um, cleaner in terms of carbon and other emissions. And we have used, we've looked at a number of different assessment methodologies when we've been considering how we might want a third party verification of what we've been doing around sustainability. So we've looked at Envision. Um, I've talked to folks in Australia who have an assessment methodology. We've looked at an, an intriguing uh, assessment or um, benchmarking activity called GRESB. It's probably one of the most awkward to say uh, um, acronyms ever invented. But it's, uh, it's one of those areas where it was pretty exciting when the insurance industry got behind LEED, right? They started seeing that, wow, these green buildings, these LEED buildings are actually um, less of an, an insurance risk for us because their mechanical electrical equipment has been commissioned and properly installed and they operate at a really low level and they have a lower or a lower turnover, higher occupancy rates. So in the GRESB world, these are the major investors globally saying, well, we're, we have trillions of dollars that we want to invest. And infrastructure is a relatively illiquid investment, right? It's, it's there for the long haul. So they're looking at these environment sustainability and governance indicators in order to understand where they want to put their money, where they want to put their investments. We participated in the pilot year and we were incredibly proud to find that we were, I believe, the top infrastructure project in, in North America and sort of six overall globally. And, you know, that, that relative score is really exciting, right? Everybody likes to be the best. But what it tells us is that we're keeping track of information we need to keep track of to manage risk, to manage what's happening in the construction area and with our program. And by doing that, we're demonstrating to our potential investors that we're, we're worth it. So just a little step to the, step to the side before we wrap up. Y'all are um, a Sustainable Design Institute, and we are pretty excited about our station facilities and our maintenance facilities. And we've identified um, some leading, leading practices we want to introduce. We'll be uh, having zero net energy 
stations. So we'll require our designers to achieve net energy positive scores for that. Again, we have the luxury of putting these in one, building from scratch, which means we can require really good efficiency. Two, we've got great solar insulation. So we have some facilities in really good locations. Um, but you know, that doesn't that doesn't just come from come from wanting and hoping. We've also got a really smart team of people who are also working very hard to set these expectations and work with the industry to make sure we've got the performance characteristics set correctly for each station. So sustainability is really integral to the delivery of these stations. There'll be zero net energy. We'll use LEED to assess them. We would like we are, would require them to achieve LEED platinum. Um, but at the end of the day, you know that metric is lovely. That score is great. But they need to be very attractive, easy to get to places. These need to be catalyst, catalysts within the communities that we're placing these these facilities so that you know, you're getting that type of investment in Fresno and Bakersfield and Gilroy and Palmdale, right? really transforming these communities into 21st century places and attracting the type of infill development. That means we're putting less pressure on our natural and working lands, which are you know, a tremendous asset. right? They make California very special. So um, those of you in the room who know what this is a picture of, it's the High Line, and we were laughing earlier because having High Line pictures in your presentation is a little bit of a cliche now, right? Everybody has a High Line picture, no matter what presentation you're looking at. So this is very deliberate on our part. I find it exciting because it's a repurposed piece of infrastructure, right? We didn't just scrap it. We actually figured out a way to invest in it as a wonderful public space. And the return on that investment has been tremendous, right? Even if you just count the people walking along it, right? Think of how much benefit that is to their health and well-being. But there's also a very tangible economic benefit. We want this type of investment to happen in our station communities, and we're committed to making these really enjoyable places. The other reason I chose this is that there's a lot of great green space on there. And you know, Melissa and I have been really enjoying sitting on your campus. It's lovely. It's a very thoughtful, beautifully laid out place. We want the same, and we are requiring the same as much as one can require beauty uh, in a contract. It's difficult. Um, but we're requiring that of our station facilities, right? We want that evaporative cooling to make a pleasant ambient environment for our riders, right? Our riders mean revenue. So everything we can do to attract them to the system, to make it easy to access and beautiful and attractive, we will be doing. The outcomes for Californians have been tremendous already, right? We've already seen a reduction of emissions on our sites. Right, that cleaner equipment means that we have, you know, a 40% reduction in some of those sort of, you know, the six sort of nasty criteria air pollutants, which is great. And tier four equipment, which we require, uh, eliminates oxides of, oxides of nitrogen by 95%. Right, so that has a very tangible, positive benefit to our, to the health of people on the site. Over the last decade, this has been a $2.3 billion investment in California. Right? We've already invested that money. That's already generating economic activity. A billion of that is going into what California calls disadvantaged communities. Right? That's going to a lot of our small businesses. It's going to jobs that are being created in these communities where nothing was happening before. So the economic output is in the billions, right? This is delivering a tangible, tangible benefit to Californians. So that is a little bit of an overview of our transformative project and a cup, bit of a smorgasbord of elements from our sustainability program. And now Melissa and I would love to engage with you on a little question and answer session. Because I bet we have a lot of burning questions in the audience. <laughs> nice. Oh, thank you. Um, so, yeah, we'll have mics here so that we can make sure to hear your questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious what the gauge is. The gauge of the track. Standard gauge. Melissa. <laughs> He's asking me a tough engineering question he is, here. Yes. So it's it's. Tier, um, excuse me, it's a class five track, I think, so it's high speed track. 
I'm not sure how they, they describe mm -hmm. the gauge of the track. It's, Do you know the measurement? No, I don't. <laughs> okay. I'm sure you can find it on the website. You don't know how big the flange is? What's that? Flange on the wheel? I sure don't. I, I'm not a railroad engineer, but... How many rails? How many rails? Two or four. I, I, I don't know the detailed engineering question. Okay, just one more. Okay. Can it go on regular tracks if it's electrified? No. Right, right. I think where you're getting to is it is dedicated high-speed rail infrastructure. We're not operating on BNSF. It's not conventional rail. Right, 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 right. And there will be two tracks each direction in order to have that through service and limited stop kind of service. Did we know? We'd have the rail engineer. I know. Thank you for the wonderful presentations. I was wondering, like, uh, in the city, we, you have all of these beautiful spaces. People can walk around the trees. But the, the city is very clouded. Where do you find the place to build those? You have to fit it in. And it depends on where you are. Mm -hmm. So we're taking a, a tailored look at each of the stations. Each station will have its own design. Uh -huh. So in some places where we have the ability to do greenfield development, there isn't a station there, or we know it's going to be fully rehabilitated, or you need additional space, you have a bit of a blank space. And uh, you, you think about what you can design there and what is happening in the area around it. So this is part of the planning work that we're doing with our cities. In more of the urban areas, uh, it's a question of what can fit, right? OK, so you sometimes have to tail certain buildings or whatever, if necessary. Yeah, we have um, minimum criteria uh -huh. that we always have to follow. So we've got to be able to operate the trains and, and make sure the infrastructure can fit so the trains can get in and out mm -hmm. uh -huh. and people can get in and out. But um, you have a lot of pictures in northern part of the California. In Los Angeles, I only see a little line there. So exactly from where to where we have this green line? Sure, sure. So it's uh, the first phase of the system to be uh -huh. built by 2029 is 520 miles. Uh -huh. And it goes from San Francisco to the Central Valley and then to LA, excuse uh -huh. me, and then on to Anaheim. That is phase one of the system. Uh -huh. 520 miles. Now, when you add phase two, you extend up from Merced to Sacramento uh -huh. and from LA through the Inland Empire down to San Diego, and that gets you to 800 miles. Oh, I see. Beautiful. Thank you very much. My name is Ryan. Uh, first of all, I really appreciate uh, you guys being out here today. A really great presentation. Took a lot of notes. Uh, one question that is kind of lingering, though. I was reading on CNN an article about the Hyperloop train, which would cost 10, uh, 10 times less and go twice as fast uh, from, uh, from so much brilliant game. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, to... It's called the uh, Hyperloop. Basically, they put a uh, sort of rail car inside of a vacuum tube that goes about 700 miles, I think. I don't know. Sure, sure. No. Right. No, it wouldn't be. <laughs> right. So, so maybe two, two points. I think one clarification is that if you do analyze the numbers and look at capacity, it, is, it isn't actually half as much. And it's probably twice as fast. But to get the same capacity as you do on high-speed rail, you actually do have to build sort of multiple right. hyperloops. Um, and, you know, I think whenever we, you know, get questions about this, it, you know, the honest answer is this is what's amazing about California, right? We have this incredible entrepreneurial spirit, and we are more than excited to tap into that and see it happen. You know, I think the Hyperloop has a journey to take in terms of proving itself as, te as technology. The value of um, the high-speed rail system is that it's proven technology in service around the world that we can deliver kind of off the shelf, right? Melissa worked for the Federal Railroad Administration, and they have some incredibly particular standards that they want us to follow to make sure that we are all riding safely. Right. So 
you know, that's a big part of it is delivering proven, a proven service. Very cool. Thank you. for coming down and uh, the great presentation. I have a question regarding the sustainability uh, part of the presentation, uh, where you talked about the number of grams of carbon mm. uh, used. What capacity are you guys assuming for the for uh, high-speed rail when you're saying that compared to cars, you save, I think, 60 grams, is like 80%, 90%? You know, so that is an assumption that the trains are, ooh, I need to double check my ridership numbers, but it isn't, um, it's assuming more like an 80% capacity. The, no, the slide I showed you is based on our ridership model. If you've delved at all into our ridership model, you'll understand that it is pretty conservative, right? We have to take this incredibly tight, conservative look at our potential ridership. It's a peer-reviewed model. And the reason we do that is because, as Melissa said, we have to operate without a subsidy. Um, and we need a, a private operator to come in and feel like this is a good investment. And so, um, so one, we start with pretty conservative numbers. So, um, and to develop that analysis, we actually looked at um, automobile fleets that assumed, I think, a 1.8 per vehicle occupancy, and also um, possibly two and also looked at the vehicles, um, including a pretty significant portion of electric vehicles. So we, we clean up the fleet of California's fleet faster than is possibly possible given, given manufacturing. Um, so, so we take some pretty conservative estimates in order to come up with that. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, I have a question about federal and state um, money that you've gotten. Um, have you received federal or state funds? And if so, what do you feel like were kind of the selling points for them? Um, <laughs> as well as what were the selling points specifically for people that don't live in California? So mm -hmm. don't benefit directly, but more indirectly. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I can start this one out. Yeah. You can add to it if you'd like. So we have a combination of funds uh, from the public sector. Federal funds, um, so th this comes out of the national program that was the high sp that is the high-speed intercity passenger rail program. So uh, the previous administration had a vision that, that in 25 years, 75% of the population would have access to high-speed rail. So we would develop using our existing passenger rail networks throughout the nation um, and building on those and ultimately building up to high-speed rail we would uh, provide a statewide integrated network of passenger rail and, and in fact, high speed or very high speed rail um, throughout uh, the nation. So a good bit of our funding, specifically a bit over $3 billion, actually came from the federal government, USDOT, FRA, high speed inner city passenger rail. We, California also, um, kind of at the same time, was passing um, a state bond act that allowed for $10 billion to be invested in the California high-speed rail system, and it required um, a, a non-state match. And so in the federal grants, they came in the form of grants required a non-federal match. And so what we did is we used the high-speed intercity passenger rail program grants. We've matched them with state funding and some local funding as well that is uh, Proposition 1A that was passed in 2008. In addition to that, um, California, of course, is very innovative and has its own cap and trade market with, with Montreal, with, with Canada, where once 2015 hit and the oil and gas industry was a participant in that cap and trade market, we saw uh, greater revenue uh, potential off of that. And so what happens is, the, uh, it is there are auction proceeds and the High Speed Rail Authority because of its sustainable infrastructure program. It is in and, in and of itself a project that is very sustainable. Um, receives 25% of the auctioned off proceeds out of cap and trade. So those are our public funding sources, the combination, um, all the way down to at the planning level where we work with communities. We took some of our federal money 
and we offered a contract program where you could work with the High Speed Rail Authority and do planning around the high speed rail stations, and the locals put in some of their money as well. So we have kind of a, a diverse public funding um, source, and we anticipate in the future, once we're at the point where we have um, operations or a certain um, amount of the infrastructure built, and we're, we're starting to run trains, or we're getting closer to running trains, the private sector is going to be very interested because we have reduced their risk and they have a greater potential to generate revenue at that point. And we also expect at that point they'll help us build out the rest of the system. So there's kind of a tipping point there. Gotcha. So probably either so you guys are part of phase two to get from um, LA or Anaheim down to San Diego. And the closest stations would be either at the Ontario airport or probably Pomona, if I had to guess. Those would probably be the closest stations to you guys. So our system has got uh, 24 stations in its, in its phase one system. So we've actually designated kind of a number of stations. Now that's a commuter line would have a, ton more stations in it. So, we, so we're not meant to be a commuter service. We are, we're called inner city passenger rail. So the sweet spot of the distance between markets is like 200 to 600 miles. And, and that's where we provide kind of these hub stations. Now we're also intended to be part of a statewide integrated passenger rail network with the air market, with the, you know, the, the interstate market and everything else. And we're, we're just a piece of that overall system and so we also, uh, try to integrate and to set ourselves up to for the feeder services that come in, whether it's Metrolink or Caltrain or BART or Capital Corridor or you know any of the other systems. Even right down to the station location, you've got the buses that can hover and have space around the station to pick people up and drop people off uh, for that first and last mile connection. So the idea is a fully integrated statewide transportation network and actually, you'll see it very soon. We've got a uh, California state rail plan coming out. And it, it too, will be the first of its kind where we will have a, a prioritized and very strategic look at the state of California from a market potential analysis to what is the existing rail infrastructure that's already out there, as that gentleman was asking really good questions about, that we can utilize or upgrade um, and then where is the high-speed rail alignment going, which becomes this high-speed kind of backbone connecting the major markets. So I'm, I'm going to take a question from the audience right now. So Melissa, what about the vacuum effect of a high-speed vehicle passing through an area? I, I get all the hard ones. This yeah. is not going to be the best technical answer, but I'll, I'll give you what I know here. Um, there is what they call a vacuum effect when a train goes from uh, open air into a tunnel. And I think if you've, how many of you traveled internationally? There were several hands up previously. Okay, so you've gone into a tunnel, you've come out of a tunnel, and you probably heard a whoosh, a whoosh your ears popped, something like that. Okay, it's when you travel really fast, that's what happens. That's not a scientific explanation. Um, so there are a lot of questions around what happens at that tunnel and how do you accommodate how do you accommodate it? And there are actually design solutions for that where the tunnel, you see the tunnel flare out at the mouth of the tunnel in order to deal with that. But our agency has been asked a lot of tough technical questions like that. We, we write a lot of technical white papers that we put on our website so that people can get some of these questions answered. In the Central Valley, we've been asked about um, how might the high-speed rail affect the bee population? Yes, um, it won't. Yep, well, and others, and, and dairy cows, who are super sensitive <laughs> to noise, among other things. We love our dairy cows. They do. What happens when you put a high-speed rail alignment ne near a dairy farm and the relocation of a dairy farm? Mm -hmm. That's a very difficult thing to relocate. Very. That's right. And what happens when you have to relocate a dairy farm? How quickly can you do it? So there, there are a lot of really good technical questions that we've been asked over the years that we write these, these mm -hmm. white papers on. Yep, and we've got a lot of great, uh, we have actually have a good noise and vibration fact sheet on our website. If you go to www.hsr.ca.gov and go to our newsroom, 
That's where a couple of uh, the fact sheets Melissa's alluding to you could find. I appreciate your enthusiasm and the facts that you've given us, uh, and uh, I'm glad to know that there is some construction already underway that I wasn't aware of. But I keep reading things that are problematic. Uh, two that I think I understand to some extent is there's something under uh, it's the cost of what's already being built is way over budget. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. I don't remember the exact figure. <clears throat> and then I believe that there's a, a federal grant uh, being weighed by the federal administration, and it would seem very likely to me that that's the first thing that they're going to cancel because of its location as well as its cost, and that was billions of dollars. So you're talking about things in the present and a hopeful future, but how likely is that hopeful future? Right. Well, those are two great questions. You've picked up on a couple of good headlines that have hit the news recently. One was um, a message about risk analysis. So we are a mega project. We have federal partners who are an investor in our system. They gave us the seed money to start the system in the Central Valley. As part of that relationship between a state and the federal government, there is oversight that goes on. These are, we call them grants, but they're actually cooperative agreements. What that means, the difference between a grant and a cooperative agreement, is that the federal partner is a, is a substantial partner at the table with you, asking you tough questions, digging into how you do business. They don't always agree with you. Um, their job is to make sure that the federal investment never gets stranded. And it is, it is done well and on budget and on time. Now, like any project, uh, lots of different variables and factors affect our progress on scope, schedule, and budget. That's normal. Doing risk analysis is what you should do. Analyzing whether or not your project is on target, below target, meeting expectation, has got some major challenges, is what you're supposed to do. Um, our board chair recently answered this question at one of our board meetings. I believe it was the, the January board meeting, yes. which you can actually find online. And he did a really nice job of saying, if no one was analyzing how we're doing business and analyzing the progress that we're making in construction and in design and development and the money that's being spent, that would be really irresponsible. Mm -hmm. To have risks is also very, very normal. We have to manage those risks. And so the risk analysis that became a headline um, in the newspaper was roughly two years old, actually. I think it was about two years old. And um, we've been doing that with the federal government for a while. And in fact, that's a regular form of kind of coordination, communication with the federal government. So are there risks with the project? Of course. Um, have there been challenges with, for example, the schedule for right-of-way acquisition? Yes. But guess what? In probably about two months, we will have spent down all of our um, first federal grant, uh, which had a, a time limit on it because it was ERA money. Um, and we are no longer at the risk that was, that was identified um, in that report saying that we may not spend the money in time. And if we didn't spend the money in time, it would go back to the Treasury. So that was the greatest risk to us, that we wanted to spend the money and use, use the public funds that were, we were selected for. So, Risk analysis and the headline, I mean, I'm, it, it's, it's not a big deal. It's a, it's a good thing that we're constantly uh, looking inward and evaluating whether or not we're on target or, or doing good work and, and where our challenges are and trying to tackle those challenges. The other one um, you brought up is Caltrain. the Caltrain funding. That's right. OK, so one of our partners in Northern California, where we will have a blended service between San Francisco um, and Gilroy actually is, is Caltrain, which is a c commuter rail line. Caltrain is in the process of um, an overall modernization project for their system, 
which has got multiple funding sources, but their federal owner, so to speak, is the Federal Transit Administration. High-speed rail is owned by the Federal Railroad Administration, and there's a couple of funny nuances in how the federal agencies kind of split the baby on that one. But the Federal Transit Administration, when you go through a grant program with them, you go through a very rote, scriptured process, and they have something that's called a full funding grant agreement that at the end of this long process of, again, working closely with your federal partner, you're granted this full fun funding federal grant agreement. Um, and, but there's years in the making. Um, FT, or, excuse me, uh, Caltrain was actually, had started that process several years ago um, in getting the money for electrification. And high-speed rail has committed matching funds to making it happen because for us, if Caltrain electrifies that line, that's one less thing we have to do on that exact corridor, and we're going to be running blended service. So long story short here, yes, the new administration has said, hold on, wait a minute. We're going to think about this for a little while longer uh, before we just hand you that full funding federal agreement. Um, and what would have been a, just a period of time in which you, you put your documentation in front of Congress and they're allowed to kind of take a look at it and give you feedback, the, the new administration, who is very new and trying to figure out probably a lot of things, uh, said, hold on and let's think about it a little bit longer. The um, Caltrain is... Uh, not, uh, not new at this game of scrapping you know, every dollar of public funds that they can possibly get. So they've got Plan A, which is FTA's full funding grant agreement that they've been working toward for two years. They've got Plan B, and they've got Plan C, and they've got Plan D. So they're currently working with the governor's office. We've all written letters of support to the federal government to uh, encourage them to go ahead and keep moving this, this forward. Um, and it, you know, it becomes an issue that crosses the aisles, so we're hoping that sooner than later uh, the administration will understand that this is not about California's politics. It's more about uh, providing a form of transportation that is the only way to get around in the Bay. I don't know when the last time was you drove to the Bay, but we have to do it all the time, and it is a nightmare. It's bad. We'd like a train. So that was a very long answer to your question, but we're still very hopeful about the Caltrain funding. Is that realistic hope? Well, that's why you have Plan B and Plan C. I don't know. I mean, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> um, so my question is like really similar to the gentleman's earlier. Um, it's about the Caltrain electrification. So I've been like also reading news as um, reading news about uh, the Trump administration deciding to cancel like the grant and I, I do understand like you're saying like there are a lot of like issues about like Caltrain um, like trying to scrap as much money as possible like over these past few years but like it's it's really similar to like his question I was just wondering like how hopeful do you think <laughs> it is for the current administration to actually support high-speed rail because at the current moment it seems like they're vehemently opposed it. Well, I've, I've actually heard a lot of, um, a lot of positive statements out, out of the new administration about um, private investments in public infrastructure, of which we are, that's what we're all setting ourselves up for. Um, I've heard very positive uh, signals from, from, you know, the same news and media that you, that you get, I get, uh, about um, investments in infrastructure and really focusing in domestically and trying to figure out how we're going to improve infrastructure. I've heard our President Trump talk about, gosh, why don't we have high-speed rail here? Every other country has it. You know, he's made some interesting statements like that, which uh, really do give us hope, actually. And um, you know, at the end of the day, I think transportation is an issue that crosses the aisles, but it's, it's keenly linked to the economics. And um, our new president is also very in tune with what is happening economically. And so we're hoping with the development potential, um, among other things, of transit and inner city passenger rail and stations development, that uh, there's a lot of common ground there. Uh, well, two questions and a comment, or one question. Um, as 
stretches of uh, high-speed rail get finished, say Fresno to Bakersfield and so on, can that be utilized by Amtrak uh, <clears throat> to speed up their service? Is that very much the same thing as sections of freeways were built that were open to traffic and then went back onto the old road and so on? Um, comment I have, having worked for Caltrans for almost my whole career, I would like to see them take over the administration of uh, design and construction. A long history of construction doing uh, with minimal expense and so on. And they have done projects in combination with in the Bay Area, BART and light rail down through San Jose. Also, they, I was worked in District 4, Bay Area. They took over the, what's called Caltran, was taken over from the Southern Pacific Commuter Service. And they still use the same right of way, same track really, but all new stations and facilities. Good questions. Uh, <clears throat> studies have shown that utilizing state forces for design is about half the cost of private. Great question. So two questions there. You asked about interoperability with Amtrak, yeah. and you asked about uh, Caltrans. So I'm going to address those separately. So we're designing a system uh, that is part of the statewide integrated network. And so in the Central Valley, I think that's where we're most closely aligned with the existing Amtrak service um, from uh, Sacramento all the way down to Bakersfield, and then influencing service over to the Bay and then down to LA. So. High Speed Rail is designing a 220 mile, well, designing a 250 mile an hour alignment, running trains 220 miles an hour um, in the, that, that uh, backbone area in the Central Valley. And, but for a couple of stations, we're pretty closely aligned with the service that's already operated there. So what are we doing? Well, we're coordinating directly um, as a state with all its rail partners, that's what we call ourselves, um, about making sure that uh, our services are linked. And in fact, we're looking at it from a market perspective. So where are people traveling to and from, and um, how are they getting there? So the state ultimately, the, the state, not California High Speed Rail Authority, will make some decisions about um, you know, per passenger mile, whether it's cheaper to run uh, or to, to buy seats on a high speed rail train or whether it is uh, cheaper to run the existing Amtrak service, right? So if you have a redundant um, uh, section in the Central Valley, you, you will make a decision about how to get people from point A to point B. And so that, that's a decision and additional coordination that's going to happen in the future. But right now, we're working very closely with our partners. Everywhere that it isn't a, a parallel corridor with the same stations, we're thinking of those other partners as um, feeder service to high-speed rail, or we're feeding their service, one or the other. So again, it requires a lot of coordination. And um, in the north, we've got the uh, San Joaquin Joint Powers Authority that was recently developed that's helping to, that is taken over from Caltrans to run that service. And in Southern California, we've got the um, Low San JPA, Los Angeles to San Diego uh, Joint Powers Authority that, that's done a similar um, a similar exercise in taking over that service. So it's kind of a simpler, more simplified arrangement that we're coordinating. Um, as high-speed rail develops, how will we fit in with the integrated passenger rail network, and how will those other systems fit in with us? And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is um, get the best service for the passenger based on where you're coming from and where you're trying to go to. So that's what it comes down to. Now, your second question was about Caltrans, using Caltrans. Well, our agency a few years ago was maybe 20 people, mm -hmm. right? And now we're at about 200, if you count the janitor. Yep. And that is probably 40 or 50 percent Caltrans employees, yeah. wouldn't you say? At least. At least. At least. Like 60. Okay. So we're using the state uh, knowledge bank that is there from a really long time of building out the transportation network and receiving federal funding, which also goes to rail and transit and all kinds of stuff. Um, we've also 
when you get down to the construction details, you know, Meg was talking extensively about how much construction go, is going on and how many jobs are being generated. We've, we've signed contracts with Caltrans for way, well over $250 million just for the work that's going on in the Central Valley right now with the highway realignments and the uh, straddle bents, or what do we call those, pergolas? pergolas um, that are being built. So there's a lot of you know, sharing the wealth and knowledge of the institution that is Caltrans that's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So we have time for one or two more questions. Just heads up. Since nobody has run trains at these speeds in the United States, who will be the operating authority for the train system the state of California? <laughs> uh, no, actually, the state of California is the public entity making the public investment in infrastructure. And bless us, we don't run high-speed rail service, right? So we're um, working to have a you know sort of globally experienced operator to come on board and actually operate high-speed rail systems. So we're gonna we're gonna play to everyone's strengths. So. California, good at building it. Operating high-speed rail will be attracting a, an operator to actually carry out that. The, um, the safety certification of the system mm -hmm. is something that, that we all work collectively on. But the California High-Speed Rail Authority takes, uh, the, I think that's right, the ownership of um, ensuring that the system gets certified. And the regulatory entity that we work with in the United States is the Federal Railroad Administration. Mm -hmm. So. We've got to safety certify everything that happens in the U.S., even if it's kind of an off-the-shelf model that's used um, internationally. We've got to mm -hmm. test it in the U.S. on the track that it'll be, that it'll be running on. Right. So yeah. you put it out to bid. Yes. Correct. Uh, maybe, you cover, <coughs> maybe you cover this already, but um, in order to achieve your um, carbon dioxide goals, were you going to be plant using electric engines and with, with the electricity provided by sol solar or other renewables? Is that the Yes, exactly. So it's, um, and, and we find, we get this question all the time, and, and it cracks us up because we realize, oh my gosh, we've spent a whole hour telling you about the system, and we, we've got to iterate that, right? Electrified high speed rail service, it's electric um, EMUs. What, are we, what is that acronym for? Electrified They're, multiple units. Electrified multiple units. So it, it's an electric train. Okay. And, and then just quickly, um, in all your projections, what sort of comparison are you expecting for the, for the cost of, say, going from Los Angeles to San Francisco compared to uh, airfare? Oh, so we do actually use um, existing airfare prices to sort of calibrate our, our ridership model. So we look at the cost of a sort of advanced ticket on Southwest, you know, like $120. Yeah, and I think we, we roughly, I mean, at this point, we're, we're not quite at the point where we would give you exact fare tickets, but we, we have no idea how much it will cost. 75% of, of an airfare ticket is roughly what we, what we estimate at this point. I took several trains, MCHEC. It's always not a full, like a... Not like a airplane or mm -hmm. the traffic on the highway, very packed, right? In order to utilize this fast train, have you done the analysis that are you going to have a full train or actually still like an M check will be? You see whether you need a place to park your car. Because a lot of people on the M train already very. MPD, how far are these two lines? Like right. If all the people from Chinchuri, the speed is slow, that means less people get onto your faster train. And unless you have a bigger places to parking, then a lot of people driving will get on this faster train. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of issues like that, right? Yes, and we're thinking very carefully through that. So part of that is you know, we're trying to keep people from uh, always driving to a station uh -huh. and instead provide mechanisms that they can arrive um, if they're close enough by biking or walking 
uh, or skateboarding, we should say that, uh -huh. skateboarding or um, taking transit, bus, uh, we're really trying to make sure the system is attractive so that you don't have to drive your car. Now, we know that's going to be challenging in some areas, uh -huh. but the governor has set some pretty challenging goals. So essentially, Meg, correct me if I'm wrong here, but one in every four of us needs to give up our car by 2030. Isn't <laughs> yes, that right? I think it is. Right. In order to achieve the 2030 goal of reducing emissions by 40 percent, essentially how it works out is, you know, one in four of us needs to kind of give up a car and live a car-free lifestyle. Right? We have to reduce the vehicle miles traveled in the state. And so high-speed rail is a pretty key part of that, right, because you're delivering a very competitive transportation option for certain distances. And so reliability is a key to attracting people to the system. So having a dedicated grade separated right of way that we own and operate means we get to have on time trains, on time delivery of folks to their destinations, which makes it a much more attractive service. And those people who would have driven to the station, as I see it too on Amtrak, I ride Amtrak a lot, um, if they had more reliable, more frequent, faster service, they probably wouldn't drive. If there was another way for them to get to the station, as long as it was reliable and it was safe and it was clean and a <coughs> way to get around, right. probably as you would experience internationally. Right. Because so if it's fast, actually, I don't think that you, ha you can have lots of stop. Otherwise, it's not no right. longer faster. Right. No, you're absolutely right. So therefore, you know, my experience, the reason I'm not taking train is a big hustle for me from home to get the train station. Yeah. Then there is lines there, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that is the reason people just prefer driving. Yeah. Now think about it, we're going to have an electric car or auto driving. Mm -hmm. You're competing all, all up to all of those. Mm -hmm. So this, is, this gets into um, choice. And, and models that help um, help us understand the choices that people make. Mm -hmm. So our ridership and revenue model, and you know, we, we update it every two years with our business plan, so it's constantly evolving. But it's getting smarter, uh -huh. and we do surveys. Uh -huh. um, that'll happen probably in the next year, where we start, we're starting to introduce more of those choices uh -huh. into the model that's uh -huh. helping us understand how many riders we get uh -huh. and what kind of revenue we get. Uh -huh. And so that's exactly how this works. It's really not about, even though the people in this room know a lot about infrastructure and Amtrak and, and different things, it's really about just you and I as a human being just making choices. How am I going to get from point A to point B? Well, I'm going to do it probably in the easiest way possible. Yes. And it's possible that I need to, I need to work. I need to not be driving my car. Uh -huh. So I need to be on a mode that allows me to not think about, you know, whether it's a, a track where the train doesn't move off of it uh -huh. or um, a plane or something like that or a bus. I, I want to be able to work so I don't, I don't want to have to drive a car because that takes me out of, out of pocket for multiple hours depending on where I'm going. So it's all about choice. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, because I'm a mathematician, so I do mathematic modeling. So I was thinking, should we try these different factors to make a model, to testing, to see what is the optimal solution? <laughs> Absolutely. You would have a fun conversation with our modeling folks. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we have, we're going to do one last question with a gentleman up there, and we're going to have to cut it off so everyone gets out of here. But uh, yeah, we'll take this one last one here. Uh, I've heard that Japan is shortly going to have a train that goes 600 kilometers per hour. That's 360 miles an hour. And uh, we're, we're working with the old-fashioned way of doing it. We're probably 30, 40, 50 years behind. And by the time that project's done, we'll be another 10 years. And it seems like we have an open checkbook on a prototype system that we're working on to, to lead us into the next phase of sustainability. <laughs> Sorry. I, I'm moved. I'm moved by the thought of being able to travel around the street. That time. And what you hear on the radio sometimes is the project is in such deep problems that they wanted to cancel the project, but it took Jerry Brown to say, no, 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 let's go a couple more billion before we decide. So there's, to me, it's very controversial. And uh, I hope you for the best, but I also hear that the train has to stop and you have to get off and get off a high speed and go into a low speed, get back on. I don't know if that's true. Uh, 
Is that is it going to be a straight through high speed, or are you going to have inter, intermittent high speed, low speed? I, well, I mean, these are things you hear. Sure, sure, absolutely. Well, we're happy to talk about you know, the stuff that you hear and give you uh, a little bit more specific information. So we, we will offer a, a one seat ride from San Francisco to Los Angeles, all the way to Anaheim, you know, wherever you want to go, there will be an express service. It'll take you two hours and 40 minutes. You never change trains. You say exactly where you are. There will be an express service on the high speed rail system. So there's an 800 mile system that will offer express services. What happens, um, you look at it from a market perspective and you make some determinations of where people are going from and to. So that, that air, air market where we always take a plane if we're going from LA to San Francisco, that will be taken over by high speed rail, which the airlines are happy to give up because it costs them money to run planes in such a short um, market area. So, so high speed rail will take over that, that short airline market and it will be the same, you know, single experience of getting on the train and getting an express service to your ultimate destination. Now, depending on where you're going, um, there may be connecting services if you're going to different parts of the state where high speed rail doesn't go. And it may still be easy for you to take a high speed train to Fresno and then hop on the Fresno bus to get to Yosemite. That might be something fun to do. You take your luggage, you take your bike, whatever it is, you hop on the train, you get yourself to Fresno, then you hop on a bus and you go to Yosemite. And then on the way back, you can take the train and the bus again. So there's lots of different options depending on where you're going to. Um, as for the controversy of the system, I would say that we're a mega project and we will always be controversial. Yes. Um, one way I like to think about it, um, we don't often think about the total cost of the highway system throughout the United States, because that's not how it happened. It was started in Kansas and connected a, a city to another city, and then it spread from there with what eventually became formula funding that came from the federal government to build out the system and then to maintain the system. The high-speed rail system, you know, we don't, we don't have that constant faucet of federal funding that just comes through for us. We had to go after competitively and compete with the rest of the nation uh, to go after grants that we were selected for, uh, making a compelling reason why high-speed rail is especially suited for California and how we were going to pull it off. Even though what we were asking the federal government for was larger than anybody's pocketbook because we are an infrastructure program that has to be developed and thought through as a holistic piece as opposed to an infrastructure program that receives constant federal funding and so you just have to keep asking for little pieces. So, you know, if you think about it that way, $64 billion is not that big of an investment when you think about it as the whole enchilada. And that's, that's the way, that's um, kind of the way we, you know, we think about it and uh, we're just trying to advance it. So we're in construction now, which is exciting. And, the funding is, is continuing to come, and we have a cap-and-trade program, which is um, an exciting program that um, allows for auction proceeds directly to our, to our system, and we're doing everything we can to work with our partners to make every dollar go as far as it possibly can. All right. I think we'll, we'll cut it off there. Thank you very much, Melissa and Meg.